The following program is a production of Pioneer Public Television. Funding for Prairie Sportsman is provided by the Arrowwood Resort and Conference Center, an ideal Minnesota resort, luxury townhomes, 18 holes of golf, Darling Reflection Spa, Big Splash Indoor Water Park, and more. Whatever the season or the reason, it's just more fun at the Arrowwood Resort. Strike Master, building quality fishing equipment for over 60 years. Visit StrikeMaster.com to learn more. Funding is also provided by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund with money from the vote of the people of Minnesota on November 4, 2008. And by the outdoor enthusiasts who are members of this station. Hi, welcome back to the show. We've had a good time exploring the outdoor world and we want to share some of the things that we found with you. Let's take a look. Hard weather and hard work are easy to find when you're seining rough fish. Big Stone Lake will be losing lots of big carp that will never spawn again because of these rugged men. Chef Kurt is a man among men in his kitchen. He'll dazzle us again with a toothsome recipe. Stay tuned. Prairie Sportsman is coming up next. Big Stone Lake is the site of a major haul of rough fish. Prairie Sportsman will show you how it's done. Join us for a day on the ice where many species of fish will be pulled out of the icy waters. Big Stone Lake is the site of the next pull for the rough fishermen. With the aid of this little high-tech remote control submarine, a net will be spread around a pod of carp and the seine will be pulled. These men and their equipment will get the job done out on the frozen lake. Big Stone Lake is a border waters lake between western Minnesota and South Dakota. It's there where this pull takes place. The men flag the route the net will take, and the process begins. These men know their business, and offloading net into the hole without tangles is a big part of it. Here's the plan. The net will be strung under the ice from one hole to the other until they have completed the circle. Two submarine units run in opposite directions to pull ropes around and complete the circle. The nets will follow. A space will be cleared so the work of cutting the big hole where the fish will be coming can begin. power auger can zip a nice hole in the ice. The men skim the ice out with their nets to clear the holes. Three sides of the big hole will be cut, leaving the men to chop out the fourth side. The 
scraping continues to get all the loose ice chips out of the way before the chopping begins. Just a little more scraping and the chopping can start. Let's speed things up and do it the easy way. Now the real work begins. A man and a chisel. Just like the old days. Put your back into it. The loader snaps it off, and the slab floats free. Now just shove it under the ice to get rid of it. Watch your step. One slip and you're in the cold water. With that job done, these men can join the others who are pulling the line from hole to hole. The tractor and its power does the work ten men did in the old days. While the men wait, the submarine pulls the line down the lake. This man waits with his hook to catch the line that the sub is pulling. He clears the hole so he can hook the line when it appears. The line should appear soon. Don't have it yet. No! You need to head to shore! Yeah! There it is. Now hook it. Mission accomplished. And here's the man running the submarine by remote control. He can hear the sub moving under the ice. He can follow the progress of his little unit towards the big hole. There his unit will join this unit. And their unique job will be completed. Hook it out and put it away. It has done a wonderful job of saving time and money for these men. Rope always has to be handled carefully on the ice. A problem is when the rope gets tangled. A bigger problem is when you could be grabbed and hurt. A capstan is powered by the tractor's power takeoff. It's all about ropes. Handling ropes is a skill. You need to be skilled and coordinated to handle the capstan. You must keep the rope from overlapping as things roll in. The nets are coming in. There's the stretcher. The floats keep the net next to the ice and there are weights to keep the bottom down. The men work as a unit to take up the net and keep it tangle free. Here comes the other net now and the fish are gathering as the seine shrinks.
in unison, the men keep things straight. There's a lot of net to be pulled before the fish get in. Now the frame is placed over the hole. Two men will stand in the water and hold on to the frame while they walk on the net to hold it down on the way in so the fish won't escape. It's cold work, but someone has to do it. You have to be tough in the cold water and in good shape to do this job. The net keeps coming in. The boxes are on to separate the catch by species. The pace is slow but relentless. The dip nets appear. There's how the ropes attach to the net. It's quite a knot. Now the nets are really rolling. They're coiled around a moving drum. The men keep the nets straight and all is well. A nice walleye comes out first. He's quickly untangled and returned to the lake. Another knot appears and the slow and steady march continues. A knife appears in case this walleye must be freed quickly. But he slides through and back to the lake he goes. The pull is getting harder now and two more men help to keep the net down as it comes in. The walleye are really showing up now. Red horse and white suckers are a smoker's delight, real gourmet food. A pike is next. They can shake him free because of his slime. Now the pull gets really hard as the fish are bunched and struggling. Now the hard pulling really gets going. Coordination makes things move smoothly. The dip nets come out as the catch is revealed. The gawkers are taking pictures. A full net is always a crowd pleaser. Men are impressed. There's literally a ton of fish in that net. A long-nosed gar appears in the nets. These fish are rare. Gar are prehistoric fish and are unchanged from ancient times. The spectators love this oddity. Dip nets grab the white bass and the sheephead. Can you pick out the big mouth buffalo and the sheephead among these carp? These men can. And they're keeping a tally as the nets roll in. The men dip out the oddballs and then the real pickup begins. A backhoe net is used to get a big scoop of these big monsters. The 
fish are delivered to a platform where the men wait to sort them. There are a lot of fish to go through today. Look at this catfish. You can thank the DNR for planting lots of them in Big Stone Lake. Into the lake he goes with a pile of other game fish. Look at that walleye. What a beauty. Lots of walleyes in Big Stone Lake. How about a 12 pound? Boxes are filled as fast as they can be, but there are more than they can handle, so a loader is brought up. The carp are skidded into the big bucket. The backhoe net keeps the sluice box full. Bucket after bucket and the backhoe net keeps the loads of carp rolling to the holding net. The loader returns time and again to move more of the catch of big carp. Boxes of white bass and sheephead are filling up fast. Carp after carp slides down the chute into the loader. Buffalo and other species are separated at the same time. It's been a long, hard day of work for these men. They've seen the lake now they're gathering the harvest of their hard work. Every net full of fish is money in the bank for these men, and they're proud of the way they've stuck with it today. Everyone here, including the spectators, have enjoyed seeing the bounty of Big Stone Lake, including the game fish. Now the net's nearly in and the pull is winding down. Everyone is happy with the catch and a job well done by a crew well seasoned. Now the day's work is nearly over and the men are looking forward to a night off. Tomorrow they'll be pulling nets somewhere else and waiting to see what that day's catch will bring. Guess what? It's time to go to Chef Kurt Anderson and find out what he's got cooking for us this time. I know it's going to be something mighty fine. Hey, Barry Sportsman, it's the name. Turkey is the game. Today we're doing a turkey cordon bleu. All right, you've probably had the chicken cordon bleu. Well, this is going to, I'm going to show you how we actually make this. So we're starting off with a little ham. I got about roughly one and a half to two ounces worth of ham here. We're going to dice this up rather small. You're going to need ham. You're going to need some type of cheese. I'm going to use a pizza cheese blend. Now, with that having been said, you'll see me with a piece of turkey here. I flayed this off the breast of the fresh turkey. I butterflied it lightly open. Uh, this part here is almost six ounces, so this is going to be a rather large piece. You don't have to make them that big. Uh, I'll tell you right now, you know, four ounces is plenty good. The other thing to remember, in this case, 
I'm going to make it so a couple of us can taste it. That's why I'm making it a little bit larger. But generally, whenever we're going to bread something, and that's what's going to happen here, when you go to bread it, it's, going to, it's not going to lose size. It's not going to shrink. It's going to stay just as large as it was. As a matter of fact, a little bit larger because you're adding to the mass. So we've got meat, we've got cheese, and we've got turkey. And we fold this up. And what we're going to try to do is we're going to try to push as much stuff into it as we can and fold it right over on itself, okay? Now, another trick that can be done, and this is a, I'll set this down here because I don't want you to get the wrong idea about safety. But here, if we can make just a little bit of a slice, we can fold this layer over, which will help us then hold that together even better, okay? See how that was done? Now, with that in, in place... Our stuffing inside, we visit the flour station. This is like a breading station in the restaurant. So you first got to bread your meat. The flour is going to help everything stick to it. It's going to dry off the meat so we can start a different coat of something. Then it goes into the egg wash. In here, Bernie had cracked two eggs. She mixed them with just a little bit of water and beat them with a fork. Then from there, we go to the breading. Now the breading is the most important part of this feature because this has to kind of stick together well. In this case, I'm using a panko breading. However, you could use croutons, breadcrumbs, anything else. But see, I wasn't happy now with how much breading stuck on there. So we're going to do this one more time because I want a good coat of breading. I really want this to hold together well for me. So I'm going to work that breading in there. And you can see how much breading was actually absorbed. Now, my goal is to have a very nice, professional-looking unit, and ta-da, there it is. It looks rather nice. Now, from here, we're going to visit the deep fryer. Now, in this case, what most places do, we're going to have to get this just slightly golden. So we're going to put that in a little holder here, and we're going to go down into the fry daddy, and we want to just get that so it's lightly golden. That's our goal. This isn't going to fully cook them all the way, but it will get them golden. Okay, once we're beyond that stage, this will end up uh, going into a pan and into the oven at 350 degrees, which will take us another 15 minutes. All right. Yeah. I can show you here just briefly what's happening. I got a little bit of blackness in there, but that's just from the other stuff. We're okay. We're okay. Here we go. This is going to firm this up nice. Okay. Now, this whole procedure shouldn't take you more than about 40 seconds. That's where this is going. At that point, I've got something that's golden. I can go right into the pan. And now, as you see how nice that looks, and it's hot, we're going to put it in the oven, and we're going to let it finish in the oven. Okay, so down into the oven she goes. We've started a little broccoli side dish that we're going to be able to use for this, and we need a sauce. And I've come up with a doozy for you on this. I don't want it to be the same old cream sauce you normally get, so we're going to start off here with something a little bit different. What we have is we're going to take some cranberries. Now cranberries are in a lot of stuff uh, already but I tell you what mixed right they can really enhance and especially in this dish because you've already got the ham and the cheese if you think along that line you're gonna fall in love with this. We're also going to use a little bit of horseradish again and we want just enough to spice it so if you take a look with the camera here you're gonna see that I've got roughly three tablespoons to roughly a teaspoon and a half. We're going to start off with that ratio just to see what happens. A lot uh, depends on how strong your horseradish is. Uh, also, I guess one other thing I'll suggest, take a little taste of your cranberries as their flavor can change throughout the year too. If they're a little overly tart, just a smidge of sugar will help, help fix that. Okay, so now that's going to go on the stove to heat up. We got about a minute and a half here on these items up top, but we got another 10 minutes on our chicken down below, or our turkey, I should say, and then we'll plate up, so we'll be back that fast. All 
All right, we're back, and we're starting to assemble the plate. The broccoli is done. Chrissy had cut it, did a great job. I usually like my broccoli in bite-sized pieces. You know, it just works that much better. With that in mind, we'll set that aside. Now we're going to grab our secret ingredient, and that was that sauce out of cucumber, or not out of cucumber, out of cranberry. Very much like a Cumberland sauce, though, okay? That's where that sea sound was coming from on me. Much like a Cumberland sauce. Now, we didn't add any more water to this. You know, it, it is possible, depending on what you buy, you might have to, but we didn't. So that'll be our enhancement flavor. Then we're going to turn around and grab that turkey cordon bleu. He's going to look like this. Now, what's important is we want to make sure that we have gotten him before he has started to leak all his cheese out. At that point, he's not going to be as tasty. Okay, so we're going to take this out. You see how done he is. We'll set him down on the plate, and he's ready to eat. So the two of us can share it for supper, Mom, if you don't mind. And there you have it, turkey cordon bleu. I hope you try it. You'll enjoy it. The time goes by way too fast on this show. We barely get started, and it's time to go. Well, we hope you enjoyed the show, and we want to invite you to come back again for another episode of Prairie Sportsman. Prairie Sportsman is available online with more photos, video, and additional information. Follow the adventures and updates on Facebook and connect with more outdoor friends and enthusiasts. Funding for Prairie Sportsman is provided by the Arrowwood Resort and Conference Center, an ideal Minnesota resort, luxury townhomes, 18 holes of golf, Darling Reflection Spa, Big Splash Indoor Water Park, and more. Whatever the season or the reason, it's just more fun at the Arrowwood Resort. Strike Master, building quality fishing equipment for over 60 years. Visit StrikeMaster.com to learn more. Funding is also provided by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund with money from the Vote of the People of Minnesota on November 4, 2008. And by the outdoor enthusiasts who are members of this station. Thank mm -hmm. you.